I am grateful for a sermon group that I am a part of and colleagues who helped share good insight for this sermon this morning. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A friend in the book club that I uh, belong to loves to host us on her back porch. It's common for her to volunteer first. She is a good and gracious host. Before we arrive, she prepares some food. She sets out plates and napkins and glasses and chocolate. Don't forget the chocolate. And she strings the lights of the string lights that she has on her porch are always on. When we arrive, it is such a hospitable place that we all have this opportunity for wherever we have been to rest and relax, no matter what our days or weeks have been. She has the spiritual gift of hospitality. Well, two weeks ago, she brought us all back together again. We've been away for a while. Everything was in its place. She greeted us with the same welcome and hospitality that we have come, become used to. And while we were catching up and enjoying the warm evening, she shares some news that she has accepted a new job out of state and would be leaving in a few months. Well, of course, we were caught off guard. All of us used the rest of our time to encourage her to reconsider her decision. <laughs> One even reminded her that she is not good at handling change and moving out of state would be a bad thing. Another suggested that she could still mess up her final interview. <laughs> and we were only kidding a little when we suggested that our prayer for her would be to come to her senses. When she returned from the kitchen, she brought us gift bags. I mean, drop the news about leaving your good friends behind in Columbus, Ohio, and then give us gifts? Party favors, no less. Talk about party etiquette. She knew that all party gifts would take the edge off of the bad news that she just doled out. She must have selected each one with such care in mind. Well, some of the bags included a coffee mug with an empower, a empowering feminist phrase on it, a holiday scented candle and a cross necklace. Well, other bags seemed a little off. French onion soup mix, a cheese ball, and a quirky refrigerator magnet. Another friend got a half-used bottle of Clorox bathroom cleaner and a used bottle of Febreze. One friend even got a partial bag of Epsom salts and a used bottle of hand lotion. And guess what? Another scented candle, but this time with its own butane lighter. I kid you not. I walked away from book club that night with a bottle of rubbing alcohol, a coffee mug, and a therapeutic exercise ball. <laughs> that was a parting gift. But sometimes we need passages like we've heard today to remind us that in the frenzy of our lives, it is important to slow down. When the world is moving too fast, it's okay to slow down. Sometimes it's a good reminder that Jesus, in his own special way, has a unique skill in party etiquette. Well, this morning's reading, Jesus says, come away to a deserted place and rest a while. How does that invitation sound to you? Are you in need of rest? Most of us are, especially now. We have been carrying so much for the last year, year and a half. <clears throat> It's time to put things down which we have been carrying. And even in the summer, a season in which everything is supposed to slow down, rest can be elusive. Jesus says, come away to a deserted place and rest a while. What surroundings help you rest? Do you have a favorite spot? Do you head to the woods or do you prefer the beach? Where do you get your best rest? In your home? on vacation, when you are alone, or when you are with friends. This past week, I have been thinking a lot about 
rest. It's not the same thing as sleep, although sleep is an important part of it. And it doesn't necessarily come with the absence of activity. Some of my most restful days have been spent doing something I love with the people I love. There's a restorative quality to rest, and it's time to let go and regroup, to get some perspective, to remember who we are and whose we are and what's important and what really matters. Jesus says, come away to a deserted place and rest a while. This invitation is offered just after Jesus has sent his disciples into the world two by two. They were vulnerable, no cloak, no extra food, just the power to proclaim repentance and forgiveness, to cast out demons and to heal. Well, the disciples are now back, fresh from their foray, their first foray into ministry. And they're back to tell stories. And they're tired. They're tired enough that Jesus thinks that they all need a rest. Away from the throngs of people who are coming, and they see them coming. They're coming and going and clamoring to get their attention and help. The disciples are in need of rest. Jesus sees that need, and he responds to it. It's a lovely moment between Jesus and the disciples. A lovely moment that does not last. When Jesus arrives at that deserted place with his tired disciples, he sees the crowd all around, and he has compassion for them. Rest time is over before it has even begun. And I'm thinking, really, Jesus? You won't even give the disciples what you promised? A little time off? A chance to debrief and regroup? Really, Jesus? I wonder what Jesus is modeling here. I am a firm believer that no matter what kind of work we do, whether it is work inside or outside of the home, it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves, to make sure we get sufficient sleep, some days harder than others, to exercise regularly, some weeks harder than others, to take appropriate time off, to use our vacation days. Taking care of ourselves is the way is a way, one of the, is one of the best gifts that we give to our families, to our friends, and to our coworkers. And when we maintain a discipline of self-care, we actually are more effective in our work, a lot more effective. Jesus wants to rest with the disciples, doesn't he? He wants that for them. And then, well, stuff happens. Life gets in the way. The crowd arrives and Jesus can feel their need, their ache, their longing, their unfocused desire to connect with something that will help them feel more more whole. They are a shepherd, a sheep without a shepherd. He is moved by compassion and he responds out of that compassion. Well, I'm struck by many things in this story. First, by the fact that this is a story about how to respond when we are worn out and overextended. When our work and our life has taken us to a place where we don't have any more to give. When we are tired. When we try to make, take a little time off, where we discover that we just can't do it. People keep showing up with their needs. It is a story about what to do when everything is worn out. Accept our compassion. Accept our compassion. And it is a story about what to do in such a situation. When we know that we are supposed to do something, when we want to do something and just trying to wonder what exactly, well, we might think about forming a committee or volunteering more hours, or just working harder. Nope. That's not the way forward, according to Jesus. The verses that are left out of this section of our reading this morning are about the time when Jesus told the disciples to care for those in this gathered community along this hillside and feed them. It's a passage about feeding the 5,000. Jesus suggests 
that using good party etiquette and giving them something to eat, maybe even more important, is giving them a place to rest. Jesus' response, let's eat. Let's take time for a meal. Let's sit down together and eat, all of us. Those in need of compassion and those who are offering compassion, if such distinctions can be made, let's sit down and eat together. It's not really the response I was anticipating Jesus saying, but it probably rings true. Eating is a great equalizer. We all need to eat. And there is nothing quite like a shared meal to bring a group of people together. It may be the only place where certain differences can be overlooked and or bridged. Eating is an opportunity to rest and renew. But what is Jesus really wants us to do is eat together. Well, boy, eating together in the time of pandemic has been really hard. One of those things that has made this year really hard is that pandemic that makes it very much difficult to have a shared meal. But the solitary nature of eating doesn't help Jesus' collective understanding. It's one of the things that makes this current season so good. The time of reopening in which we are in, the opportunity to gather once again at tables with others. What a blessing and a gift. Even as we have been regularly celebrating communion online at the nine o'clock service all through this pandemic, and regularly online at 11 o'clock once a month, and we have returned to in-person worship, it has been good and helpful to gather together around the table once again on the first Sunday back to share communion. Because eating together is a good thing. But I'm aware that some of us have a complicated relationship with food. Right? I'm thinking of those of us who have experienced eating disorders or compulsive eating or other problematic relationships with food. And I hope that you can translate this story and Jesus' invitation to eat together into rituals of nurture and sustenance that are safe and healthy for you. Back to the story and the meal that Jesus shares. It's interesting that the same verbs that are used in this passage about feeding of the 5,000 are the same verbs that they use, that Jesus uses in the upper room with his disciples the night before he dies. The words we remember and claim and celebrate when we gather at a communion table together. And that sequence, I think, is part of good party etiquette. To gather, to receive, to bless and break and give. First, Jesus gathers the people into community, into groups, and somehow manages to find fertile ground of community in a deserted place. He gathers them in the life together. The second thing is that he receives. He accepts what is given, what is right there in front of him. He receives the exhaustion of the disciples. He receives the hopes and longings of the people, receives the five loaves and two fish, that they're able to scarce up. He receives the day and the life and the flock that God has given him. Jesus receives. And he looks up to heaven and he blesses the food before him and he thanks God. He blesses. And he stops to survey all around him and all that belongs to God. And the light in people's eyes, the green of the fertile patch of the community, the blue of the sea, the smell of the air, Jesus stops to survey all of them and blesses them, to claim this time and this place for God. He blesses and he breaks. He breaks bread. He doesn't hoard it or guard it. He does not insist upon only that which is perfect or whole or unblemished. Jesus does not play it safe or stand back or admire it. No, he breaks it. He breaks it. He takes a very good, perfectly good loaf of bread and perfectly good afternoon with his disciples. A perfectly good life as a carpenter in Nazareth. And he breaks it. He breaks it open, breaks it wide open into pieces. And then he gives it. 
He gives that bread to his disciples to give to his sheep that are scattered across the green grass up in front of him. And in time when everyone is tired, at a time when it is clear that there is not enough, when there is more to do than hands to do it, and when the disciples are preached and teached and healed out, Jesus gives and gives again out of compassion. And so maybe today's party etiquette is gathering and blessing and breaking and giving. That's the story of the feeding of the 5,000, a story of communion and a story of any shared meal together. It's our story of our life of faith together and the work of God's love in the world. We gather, we receive, we bless, we break, and we give. And we eat. So the messier the, that life gets, the more important that meals seem to become. So when life is going off the rails, and when you are exhausted, and when you don't know what is coming next, eat, preferably with others. So gather, receive, bless, break, and give. That is our work, and that is God's work of love in the world. 